I'm Stuart Cameron. Welcome to Friday's Look at Rugby. And last week, Scotland did well against the All Blacks, but sadly not well enough to get that elusive first win in 109 years and 30 attempts at trying. Tomorrow, they move on to Kilmarnock to play their third and final game of the autumn series against Tonga, a match which they won't be taking for granted. After all, it was two years ago when Tonga beat Scotland at Pataudry and that resulted in the axing of Andy Robinson as head coach. We begin today by hearing from the Scotland camp, starting with captain Greg Laidlaw. Well, we're in a good place, apart from being a bit mashed up a little bit. It was a, it was a tough game of rugby at the weekend. But... Obviously, clearly disappointing just to come up a little bit short, but for large parts of the performance, uh, we thought it was a, a tremendous effort um, by the players, but there, there's still room for improvement. We've done a, a good review, looked at a few things that we can improve on, and it just shows we were, we were right in that game at the weekend, and it's a good learning process uh, for the players, and especially after a good win against Argentina. And it's now a really important, good training week, uh, and we finish on, on a positive note in, in what will be a, a tough game. These boys are built to play rugby, that's for sure. They're, they're very aggressive, they, they love tackling, tackling, love the breakdown area. So it'll be a tough tough contest for us, but you know we believe we've got the, the game and the game plan to, to turn them over, put them under pressure, we think, you know, move the ball, move the point of contact, we can uh, test their fitness um, and try and run them around. I'm enjoying the way we're trying to play, I think that's the way the game should be played. Um, and I think I'm just enjoying a, the belief of Ernst trying to install in the players and install in the, in the young players. And again, uh, from the weekend, I think you know you, most people would have saw that uh, the way we got stuck in, the way we moved the ball, and, and we caused them a lot of problems at the time. Alex Dunbar is from Dumfries and very much part of the Scotland setup. He'll be lining up tomorrow at centre. Of course, he enjoyed his time at Selkirk Rugby Club a few years back. So, how's he looking forward to this one? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's another opportunity. Um, had a hard look at the first couple of games. Um, there's areas we've obviously improved on from past games, but there's a couple of areas that we need to work on even more. Um, you know, we had chances at the weekend there against New Zealand with overlaps. Um, and with space but it's just a little finer details to get the ball there and obviously make the most of the opportunities we have you know everyone's got a great understanding of where we want to go and what we want to do so as for a whole point of view as a team performance as well I think as a forwards and backs point of view we've really gelled well um, there's a lot of options it's not just sort of forwards picking and going picking and going backs having to go forwards 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 you know we're really integrated together and there's a lot of forward options out wide as well which helps the backs to chuck them up in a decoy line or let them carry great quick ball. And it's just um, having mul- multiple options, really. Um, we want to play at a quick tempo. And if you can get big ball carriers running out wide, you know, generally going against lighter opposition, you know, you can make quick guards. Um, if they present the ball well and we do our job, then we've got quick ball for the next couple of phases. And then, as any defence will come up against it if you get quick ball for a number of phases they're struggling so that's a big thing we've been working on is just creating quick ball getting tempo in the game and just having multiple options to attack with Finally we hear from Gordon Reid a man from Ayr who's bound to get on at some point tomorrow as a replacement he certainly can't wait for his chance to play in front of basically a home crowd for him from that part of the world It would be great to get down there down to get near my area um, and see some from all your faces um, supporting us to be honest I thought we had a good game, uh, but yeah, every every game there's um, stuff that needs to kind of get fixed. So um, yeah, no, we've been working hard at the training this week, and uh, hopefully we can improve it this week coming. That's some of the places we play, and in Cardiff, and uh, some of the boys in the Premiership playing uh, the kind of surfaces. So it's kind of say it's it's more a fast kind of flowing uh, game. Um, obviously because you're not slipping everywhere it's it's much more steady underfoot for scrummaging so it could be quite better and I think it could be beneficial for us because as I said before it's quite a fast flowing pitch we've got a lot of uh, um, good strong runners in the, the mobile pack kind of thing so I think it could be beneficial for us On the local scene last week it was all about the cup and not very good news either for local sides Selkirk, Peebles and Jed Forrest all exiting at the second round stage Hoyt YM couldn't raise a team so they're out as well Kelso just got over the winning line against Preston Lodge, two divisions below them, to go into the next round, while Hoyk hammered Marr on the road, and both will join Gala and Melrose in the third round, Gala and Melrose, of course, joining the competition at that stage. In the Shield competition, there were wins for Berwick over Hoyt Quinns and Hoyt Lindeen over Earlston.
We'll look at tomorrow's fixtures at the end of the programme, but first an interview with a Jed Forest legend who went on to become a world champion 60 years ago this month. I'm talking about David Rose, now 84 and in fine fettle. Back in November 1954, he was part of the Great Britain Rugby League team that beat France in the final of the first ever Rugby League World Cup played in France. I popped over to see him earlier this week. Well, David, it's been 60 years this month since you won the World Cup, uh, which was an absolutely tremendous achievement. What are your own memories of those days? Well, to be truthful, uh, it's such a long time ago that things are a bit vague. But uh, to be included in the 18-man squad to go to France to represent the Great Britain in the Rugby League inaugural World Cup w- was very good for me and the rest of the lads, of course. From the playing point of view, I would say that the, the, the initial uh, squad had five very seasoned Rugby League internationals in the squad, and uh, the rest of us were reaching that level for, I would say, the first time. This put a good thought in, in my head, and I've no doubt the rest of the, the ones that were receiving their, their first call-up to give us a bit of confidence, I would say. There were 30,000 French people in the stadium. This, of course, was the inaugural World Cup, so it was quite uh, quite an event worldwide, wasn't it? Oh, yes. It, 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 it was uh, apparently dreamt up by the French... They had had a very successful tour down under, as they said, and they'd actually beaten Australia in their own backyard. And, and they, of course, came to the, to the World Cup in their own country full of confidence and uh, full of promise. Uh, we played Australia in Lyon, managed to beat them, and on we went to Bordeaux, where we beat the New Zealanders, and we drew with... France in Toulouse and the powers that be decided that they couldn't be a, it couldn't be a drawn event it had something had to be done so they arranged a playoff at the Parc de France in Paris we went on there and I think there was about there was over 30,000 in the stadium it, it looked it looked a packed stadium I don't know how big a ground it really was but we managed to pull off that one 16 13 everybody played to their full potential, I would, I would say, on that occasion. Dave Valentine and I had, it was an outstanding game. And the two halfbacks, Helm and, and, uh, and Gordon Brown, from, who played with Leeds. You know, it, it was a tremendous experience. So what about your own memories of, of the final itself? Because you scored a try, didn't you? Yes, I think I just scored before half-time, far out. You still remember it? Oh, well, very vaguely, very <laughs> vaguely. Yeah, I remember getting the ball from uh, Phil Jackson, a top-notch centre in these days, I And uh, I managed to find a bit of room, and I scored near the corner flag, yeah. Some papers didn't give Great Britain a chance at all. But went out there, and uh, we had a good manager, Gideon Shaw, and uh, Dave, Dave Vall who was a team captain, he also took over the coaching side and there was a rallying call there and uh, we built ourselves up into, I would say, a formidable unit and much to everybody's surprise that, that we did the job that was intended. And the pressure was totally off you? T- totally off us, aye. No, no at all. I mean, we, the, the, the Australians and the New Zealanders and the French were bedecked in blazers, ties and everything. And we went in our ordinary civvies, if you like. And it led the famous Peter Wilson, who was a, a sports writer of some note at the time, uh, to put a headline in one of the papers, The Hapless Led by the Hopeless. <laughs> but you had the last laugh. We had the last laugh, and that was, that was very good. Yeah, very good. There was a period in rugby union, rugby league history, where it was very much frowned upon. You either did one or the other. But going right back, there wasn't. It wasn't as controversial. Well, I don't think so because uh, initially it wasn't formed straight away rugby league because there was a split from the south in England, and it became the Northern Union. And I think the reason was uh, that. Uh, the North broke away from the South was that uh, they, they couldn't uh, afford to have a day off 
or half a day off because they lost their wages, I think, and that's how it came about. And then it, it, it progressed there to Rugby League, which uh, they were given uh, payment for. And then that was when the complete breakaway started. I think that would be, if I, might, if I remember the date right, 1895. And then it took 100 years to 1995 uh, to the Rugby Union, uh, and, and the Rugby Union became professional as well. Why did you go to Rugby League after a very su- successful career, Jed? Well, obviously, there was a cash incentive, but there was also the challenge uh, to see if you could prove yourself, which, which in, w- was uh, two things in my mind. And what about um, your own rugby union career? Uh, well, I started off with Jed Thistle, progressed to Jed Forest, played a few games from the south, and then I was conscripted into the RAF, and I managed to get into the, the RAF side. Before I made the RAF side, I was, I was called up for the trial. We played trials in these days at Murrayfield. I played two or three trials, and then I was selected to go to France in 1951. And I played on the left wing then. Funnily enough, I played on the right wing in the league. I played in 51 and 53, yeah. What were your memories of your first camp for Scotland? Oh, great. I, there's, I think that's the most vivid memory that I would say anybody can have, is running on, running on the field wearing a Scottish jersey for the first time. What was the build-up to that like? Ah, it was very very good. We, we didn't know what was happening. You know, it was so so strange to be playing in the old Cologne Stadium at that time against France in, in a full stadium. It was quite nerve-wracking. We just missed out on that one, I, I 14-12. But I, I did manage to, to cross the line on a couple of occasions. And, of course, very different to, to what it's like winning a cap these days. Uh, it seems that you know people can, can win a cap quite easily, but back then it was a totally different ball Well, I, I, it was. It, it was I, I think, I think uh, if, I, if I dare say, that, that uh, you had to prove yourself on the field, you know, with, with, the, with the, the big five, as they were called in these days, the selectors, you know. I, and what do you remember from the game itself? Fourteen, twelve, France won. Yes, I, I, I remember. I remember it quite well. Uh, Four was were, were outstanding. Uh, Kenan Munth, the captain, and uh, Douglas Elliott, a back row, a rangy back row forward. It could be picked for any team, you know. Uh, but uh, it was it was an open game. France gave them the chance. If he didn't get in their faces, they they could want to go get the open rugby going, they were difficult to to contain. David Rose, one of the great characters of the game. It's certainly hotting up in the world's oldest league with two matches under the lights tonight and one being played tomorrow. Starting with this evening, the most intriguing of the two is down at Mansfield Park. Hoyk, who beat Melrose last month, taking on Selkirk, who'll want to show Hoyk that they're not far behind them at this time. And a win against the Greens will put the suitors right back into the mix. Also tonight, Jed Forrest hosts Melrose at Riverside Park, both games kicking off at 7.30. Then tomorrow at 3 o'clock, Gala face Kelso at Netherdale. Gala looking to get back to winning ways, while for Kelso, they're out to get their third win in a row under new coach Gary Holborn. In the Border Shield tomorrow, Earlston play Duns and Hoyt Quinns host Hoyt Lindeen, while Gala YM are away to Ross High in the final of the Regional Bowl. The featured game on Radio Border's Super Scoreboard Live tomorrow is Gala versus Kelso in the Booker Border League with Stuart McFarlane, while I'll be at Kilmarnock for the Scotland match against Tonga. But that's it for your rugby tonight.